What made Led Zeppelin so unique as a band were the four individuals who made up the band. Each of them was very, very, very good at what he did. Now, that doesn't guarantee that when you put four people together who are very good at what they do individually, that the combination will work. But good Lord, it jolly well did. None of us really knew anything about how good we were individually. And that didn't really seem to matter. What mattered was the fact that together we had moments when we earned the big grin. Everyone was inspired in that band. Everyone was a, a star, you know. There, there wasn't, there wasn't a, a weakness there, you know. Every single person was strong. And uh, the chemistry of the four people put together was, uh, well, we know what it is now. There's a corny word that's used a lot called chemistry. A lot of people use it. It's used in articles and a lot of people always say it, but it's, this is very true, you know, that we possess when we walk out onto that stage an affinity, the four of us, one to each other, that uh, I don't see very often. We knew we were appreciated by the fact that people were coming along to see us in such great vast numbers, but no one expected this. We first played together in a small room in Gerrard Street, in a basement room in what is now Chinatown. And it was just wall-to-wall -wall amplifiers, you know, just marshals, sort of. And there was a space for the door, <laughs> and that was it. And um, literally, it was just everybody looking at each other, saying, well, what should we play? <laughs> so there was an old Yardbirds number called The Train Kept Rolling, which Jimmy said, well, it's just like, it's in here, you go down, digga da 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 digga da digga Right, so, three, four, 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 the whole room had just exploded, you know. Silly grins and, oh, yeah, this is it, man, yeah. So, you know, it was, it was pretty bloody obvious, actually, <laughs> that it was, was going to work <laughs> from the first number. Hey, girl, stop what you're doing. That you got a lot, and that's what I want. Communication breakdown, it's always the same. Having a nervous breakdown drives me insane. Communication breakdown was a sharpened up version of the song Train Kept a Rolling that Jimmy Page used to play with the Yardbirds. It explodes basically into life. It's, um, uh, it's, you know, it's got a real metallic crunch to it. It's f they're up and running straight away. I can remember when I first heard it, which was uh, off a record from my brother, I, I was hooked. And that was at about the age of about nine. And it tells you everything you want to know about Led Zeppelin in two and a half minutes. Jimmy Page's guitar solo comes in at like one minute 25, and it is just the most ferocious, exciting solo you've ever heard in your life. Led Zeppelin are known for their longer pieces, so I think it's a really good um, illustration of the way Page was able to build a riff in, take the other three with him and create such intensity. Which is a very simple riff. A three chord riff. But again, you've got Page's arrangements on there where he overdubs a different time signature over this. After the verse, you get a pulse. which gives the song real movement and then the, the chorus is a, almost a, a straight rock and roll. And it's those accents which is another, another Jimmy Page thing where he's almost throwing off the beat accents in there. John Bonham, Communication Breakdown, a classic track, I guess you'd call it. Just that lovely open sound, the big bass drum, you can feel it resonating through. I'd say also, you get that feel, there was sort of an underlying almost funk feel to his playing, those ghost notes that he would play, very powerful, very open, and again, all those phrases, those pushes that he would do with Jimmy Page, which were classic trademark, 
playing styles of his. Great drums, um, you know, solid bass. It, the package is there. It's already delivered to you um, straight off. Everything was going and firing up in all directions. There was lots of tangents musically. Um, well, I started developing the use of my voice to match in with what Jimmy was doing uh, with the guitar, you know. I mean, it's all a long time ago now, but I know that it, it was quite a moment when we suddenly started phrasing and scatting together on Dazed and Confused. Dazed and Confused um, in the studio is, is a complete tour de force, musical tour de force. Live, it's an even bigger tour de force because it goes on for ages. The original was what, six, seven minutes long, eight minutes long, something like that. The improvisation within that track, on stage live, could go anywhere. By the time that I'd heard it being played live, which was, you know, early to mid 70s on some of the old bootlegs, it was 27, 28 minutes plus. They weren't confined to, to any sort of set pattern that perhaps the studio version would have tied them to. Days Confused came in because Jimmy knew that and I could never get the sequence for years. It kept changing oh, all the time, you know, oh, different parts and I was yeah. never used to that. When you look at the old footage of them playing it live, it's just amazing. I can't think of many bands that would manage to do that and hold, you, hold your attention for 25 minutes. The riff itself. <laughs> It's, it's quite a simple riff. It's a strange descending chromatic chromatic sound. Um, live, he used to punctuate that with some harmonics on the... There's all sorts of strange strange passages in, in, uh, in Days. There's that little... Which always reminds me of Paranoid Black Sabbath. It's not there. It always sounds a very, a very similar riff. Um, it was stretched out live, and of course you got the violin bow, which unfortunately I didn't bring with me today. I think it's the first instance where Jimmy Page um, starts playing his guitar with a violin bow. Stroking the strings and making all sorts of atmospheric noises, and then striking it, striking the guitar strings with the violin bow, and sending the sound spinning round the room. It tells you Page is the wildest most incredibly ferocious guitarist that had ever walked the earth. I used to do, I didn't do anything but I didn't make the guitar sound different. You know, the funniest thing about all of this bow business is, you know, David McCallum, his father was a, a session violinist over there, and he's the one who suggested about this bow business. Have you ever tried bowing the guitar? And I said, well, I said, no, I haven't. I said, well, I don't think it'd be very easy because, you know, like a violin has got an arched, you know, an arched neck so to speak and an arch bridge the, the guitar doesn't you see but he said i'll have a go and i tried it and in fact um it was that was that was the thing that gave me the idea to do it this was sort of fantastic extrovert showmanship coming from uh page and he's he uses it as a sort of as a total sort of showpiece for electric guitar playing perhaps lacking the tastefulness of beck and, and maybe lacking the inspired spontaneity of Jimi hendrix um still he managed to sort of take uh, the guitar solo to uncharted waters. I actually think he was the first guy to sort of, to make the rock, you know, rock god guitarist as a sort of axe hero. He sort of more or less invented it. We're looking at the first album and it's, you know, it's a mixture of, there's blues on it and there's, there's acoustic music and there's, I mean, you've got Black Mountain Side and Instrumental which is finger picking and then you've got the then you've got the extension of that type of thing with uh, babe i'm going to leave you which starts with the acoustic but it also has all this you know high power accents on it as well electric accents and very dramatic quality you know i mean i still think that holds up you know i think they will hold up i'll play that again which you need fingernails for, or mine are all broken. Which is a lovely finger prick descending chord sequence. And then once again, he uses octaves to, to fill out the riff. Now the, the riff to it when, it, when it breaks in, follows the same chord progression. But instead of being nice, gentle finger pick chords, you get this. <laughs>
a lot of emotion in it. No one can sound like Robert Plant. It's that, it's that shivers down the spine voice. There's, nobody sounds like it. And the first, the first album, it, it must have just knocked people off the seats in the, in the 60s when they heard that. Robert Plant was a unique vocalist. There's no romanticism about it, but um, obviously with the hard edge of the band, um, that sort of didn't, it took away any, any sort of sugary sweetness that you might sort of, it might otherwise have found. What makes this so special, of course, is that they were just starting out. And, and, you know, just to hear it sometimes sends shivers down your spine. I told you now I hear it calling me the way it used to do. John Bonham's drumming on Babe, I'm Gonna Leave You is very sort of stop-start and disjointed, but it gives the song a real dramatic quality. Acoustically, uh, you know, it's all going on, but then you've got a real solid backbeat from John Bonham. It hits a kind of tribal groove. Um, and, and it's there that you see, I think, for, you, you really start to see an example of, of the force of, that John Bonham was as a drummer. The way he's, he's done that, I think, is indicative of, of the way he was going to record many albums on from there. He, he was a very, very important part of Zeppelin. The guy could do anything, um, and, and that's a perfect example of him saying, hey, look, I'm a young pup, but boy, am I good. It's very much a jazz riff. <laughs> It starts with a, almost almost a jazzy kind of vibe to it, um, which of course is intrinsically linked to the rhythm section, led, I guess, by John Paul Jones's bass playing. It's got a real groove to it. It's just a groove, and you can just feel Bonham and John Paul Jones interacting in a kind of really funky way, and you could tell, it's interesting, you could tell they both listen to a lot of soul music and a lot of James Brown. The rhythm section in, in, uh, in the track is, is indicative of how Zeppelin were going to put the tracks together, I think. Strong drumming, extremely strong bass line. It moves towards a climax that shudders and grinds to a halt, and it finishes one of the most remarkable albums that anyone had made at that point. I always remember the first review of the, of the first album in Rolling Stone, <laughs> where they just sort of dismissed it out of hand, <laughs> completely out they would, I don't even think the bloke would, would listen to it and said as much. Jimmy Page had definite ideas about what he wanted to do. He was very keen, apparently, it's reading in the press like, like I don't know him, he's very keen reading in the press. Um, he wanted to have this light and shade of the music and the story is when he first introduced the music he wanted to play to Robert Plant, they went round his house, played several albums and you can see from the first album the beginnings of that the light and shade of the acoustic numbers of the quiet and the loud and the effects of the songs. I had an idea of what exactly what I wanted to do with the, with the first album and the band. There's a lot of contrast on the album and that's one of the things that I really wanted to get together which I didn't think anyone else was doing and that's and that was the uh, but then again you know that's the way it shaped up. Playing Zeppelin 1 it was clearly a band that had been out playing the stuff live practicing in the studio and Page had certainly been playing it with other musicians, or a lot of the songs with other musicians. So by the time he got into the studio, you know, you're talking a, a budget of six or seven hundred, eight hundred pounds or something like that, recorded in four days. You know, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, and there's there's the album, and and the proof was in the pudding. It was the music that sold it. Having set that sort of, sort of heavy rock template. It was, uh, it was obviously eagerly accepted, expected, and they were expecting another, another heavy rock album, which is exactly what Jimmy Page delivered. I mean, I don't think he accused him of commercialism at the time, because it, I think this is the album he wanted to produce. A whole lot of love continues the swagger that they had finished their first album with. Well, it's the riff that ate the world, isn't it? Dun, 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 dun. Everybody knows it, and, and it's a calling card. It's like, hey, we're here. A Whole Lot of Love is really the most exciting rock and roll song in the world ever, bar none. Jimmy Page could write a riff that might be so simple or even lent a little too much on some old blues, as it were, but um, it's the simplicity of, uh, uh, at which is the effectiveness. The power of Whole Lot of Love, the sexual shenanigans that go into the middle, the coitus non interruptus is something to behold and also something to use as a soundtrack if you so wish to your 
misbehavior. This sexually charged midsection where, where Plant comes into his own, as it were. Woman! 26,000 larynxes. Woman! 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 It's a bit risque, it's a bit dangerous, it's a bit threatening. There's uh, sort of raw sexual energy. The drums just hold you off, almost like a kind of woman teasing you. And the drums just hold you off, and then Jimmy Page just comes in there with this fiery solo. No messing around rock and roll. Best track on Led Zip 2. In fact, it's probably one of the greatest rock and roll songs ever written. That really is about the most exciting Led Zeppelin song and the most exciting rock and roll moment I can think of in history. What is and what should never be was a conscious effort by Led Zeppelin to try something a bit different on their second album. What is and what should never be follows a whole lot of love on Led Zeppelin 2 and it is contrasting um, and you've got Love at Plant with lyrics that you know are beginning to mean something. It's very dreamy, the whole atmosphere of that track is really dreamy. It opens very softly, very sort of ethereal like um, and that drumming is very controlled. There are moments where you'd be, it's easy to think that it's not actually rock music, it's so mellow and dreamy, it's just got this great sort of almost sort of Sunday afternoon kind of dreamy vibe about it. What is and what should never be uh, is a perfect example of, of Zeppelin managing to combine the light and the shade. Um, and as such, John Bonham's drumming on the track um, is, is perhaps the most important thing there. Bonham keeps it mellow, just sort of lightly tinkering on his ride cymbal uh, until then it starts to grow and uh, Paige takes it up into sort of third gear. And then when they would get to the main riff, John Bonham would attack the drum kit, you know, as only John Bonham could, and uh, it would suddenly be a huge rock sound. What is and what should never be was to be a hallmark of Led Zeppelin song constructions. Heartbreaker is, is a, a riff again, and it's a blues riff, except he's very clever because it, it shifts, it goes up a tone musically, and it changes key, which was quite unusual for a rock band to actually change key quite so dramatic. So it goes from one key to another key and goes back again. The song is all about the, the musical interaction between Robert's voice and Jimmy's guitar. Plant is at his very best here. Um, it's sort of heartfelt. Again, a lot of raw sexual energy going on. Uh, that's the undertone. This is again a, a fine example of Jimmy Page conjuring up this magical riff seemingly out of nowhere that's so simple. I'd say the rhythm section dominates it more than Page and Plant, and you can't often say that about a Zeppelin track. Wonderful bass drum technique. When he goes into that cut time feel, or double time feel, he's just playing that open ride cymbal, just giving it all he has. When you listen to it live, it just shows what a different band Led Zeppelin were playing live compared to in the studio. They were great in the studio. They were more than highly proficient but no matter how hard they tried, they never captured the, the essence of what the band were like live. Live, Heartbreaker was another song that could get extended from anything up to 10, 15 minutes. And you can just tell that um, they're having the time of their lives. It may not be the most complicated of Led Zeppelin songs, it certainly doesn't feature the most complicated set of Led Zeppelin lyrics, but it's all about feel. Blues is essentially all about feel. Thank You is a major development forward in Led Zeppelin's acoustic side. There's Jimmy Page picking away delicately at an acoustic guitar, while John Paul Jones adds some sturdy Hammond organ. It's probably the most eloquent thing they've delivered up to this point. Possibly for the first time you can hear Jimmy Page's love of people like John Remborn and Bert Jansch in the folky sort of playing on his acoustic guitar. It's bluesy, but it's but you can start to hear that they've they've really they've they've tasted some, uh, a place where no one else has been. Um, even the bands that were working the same genre at the time, um, they were more kind of sedate, if that's the right word. Um, this is kind of 
unbridled power that they've tasted. And, uh, you know, Paige, you can see his development as a record producer. Thank You is, is one of the softer tracks on, on Led Zeppelin 2, which itself was quite a strong rock-led album. And I think it's a very good example of the hippie idealism that Robert Plant brought to the band. Thank You was uh, a love song to Robert Plant's then wife uh, when it was recorded for Led Zeppelin 2. People forget he was a real, he loved soul music as well as blues music and world music and all these other things. So he had a whole bunch of influences that crept into his vocal style. My performance I wasn't that pleased with first and second, but by the third I was being able to sing. I mean, Gallows Pole is one of my favorite tracks and Immigrant Song is too, you know. Immigrant Song is a classic that became an instant show opener for the band almost as soon as they'd written it. By now, Led Zeppelin were oozing confidence from every pore, and you can tell in the way that Page, John Paul Jones and Bonham all batter the riff to insensibility in their own little individual ways. Driving rhythm, syncopated rhythm, and Bonham just sits on it the whole way through. Sure, he plays some nice accents here and there, he breaks it up as he does. When I first heard Immigrant Song, which must have been around about 1970, I guess, probably the year it was released. Um, it was one of those, you know, rip-roaring tracks. It comes thundering out of the speakers. It must have scared the hell out of the clergy at the time. They wouldn't know what the hell was going on. Bang, straight in your face. It's demonic. It's, it's, it sounds almost, it, it, it's not evil, but it's, it's menacing. The lyrics are inspired not by Celtic mysticism, but by Norse mysticism. Come from the land of the ice and snow, you know, hammer of the gods, Valhalla, I am coming. The, you know, this is all inspired by the Vikings. I mean, obviously Robert was on a bit of a Viking trip. He got the idea for the lyrics when the band stopped off in Iceland en route to an American tour and played a show there. I think a lot of people perceive him as a hippie because he was interested in this kind of folklore and what happened with the Celts and the Saxons and the Normans and all this stuff. So there's a lot of Celtic overtones, but I don't think that necessarily means that that's the only interpretation you could have in the song. I think years later, Robert Plant said the lyrics really didn't mean that much. Um, but then that's quite often the way with rock songs, isn't it? They've written what they want to write, and we as fans and, and listeners interpret what we want into it. And for me, that was definitely, and has remained, one of the best Zeppelin tracks ever. Since I've been loving you, it's got such drama. I mean, the way it kicks in slowly, the mood builds, it's again, the whole four of them at their best. The track, Since I've Been Loving You, uh, allows Jimmy Page to stretch a little bit as a guitar player. Absolute classic blues. And, and prob there's probably, in my opinion, there's probably no better player in a hard rock band that, that definitely got to the upper echelons of rock than Page. Interestingly and cleverly, he chooses not to opt for not the loud, over sort of driven Marshall sound, but he goes for quite a small, tight guitar sound, which is sort of ring, manages to wring out more emotion out of it. One of the other things you, you see in the, the, this song, uh, which is quite interesting because it's quite an early track in their career, is John Paul Jones was a keyboard player as well. He also played mandolins and all sorts of stuff. He wasn't just a bass player. And, uh, and he's playing some great Hammond organ in this. John Paul Jones' contribution to Since I've Been Loving You, I think, is much the same as his contributions to the vast majority of the tracks they recorded. Um, whether it be in the early years or later on, he was hugely influential in the arrangements of, of most of the songs. He was an amazing arranger. He had incredibly sharp ears. And he was into music that, he brought music to the band that I think may put a different colour into the, the mix of the band that would have been missing if, if you just took these other huge charismatic guys and you just took them as, as the, the, uh, what the band were about. And J John Paul Jones is easily forgotten, but he shouldn't be, his contribution to the band shouldn't be underestimated. His work since with other bands, um, things like with, with R.E.M. His string arrangements are always amazing and always unexpected. If you don't recognise That's The Way by name, uh, you'll certainly know it immediately when you hear the, the, when the music starts. Uh, it's a simple little acoustic song, very evocative, very similar to a lot of the sort of more pastoral pieces that appear on Led Zeppelin 3. The acoustic tracks on there are, are just wonderful and uh, 
that's the way is probably the outstanding, outstanding acoustic number on there. Each album is very different. There's a lot of different things on each one. Yeah. And I thought that three was especially different from one and two, which were basically very heavy sort of mm. music. Mm. And there's a lot of acoustic stuff on three. Yeah. From the very beginning of working together, the acoustic guitar had been there, whether it was on Babe, I'm Gonna Leave You or Your Time Is Gonna Come through. So it was no big deal. It was just kind of important to get away from a whole lot of love and say, hey, well, and we also do this. It suffered in sales. I think it was a bit of a disappointment. The fans didn't know quite what to expect. They had two heavy albums. And the band themselves, I think, were disappointed with the reaction to it. When we got to about the third, I think, when we started using acoustic, uh, they said, oh, uh, Led Zeppelin had gone, gone acoustic, you know, that changed the style and everything. With the critics screaming for our lives and blood, saying, what's this crap? They had this policy that you were God one minute and shit the next, you know, and that's the way that they, you know, to keep the, the paper going, the controversy and stuff, you know. And in the end, I thought, that's a trash, I'm not bothered to read this. As for the question of whether it's a filler, I don't think there's such a thing as a Led Zeppelin filler. To even suggest that it's a filler is insulting. We thought what we were doing was, was right and good, you know, and it, we knew, we felt it was quality music, and we had to, I mean, you've got to live by what you believe in, otherwise you got, you know, you might just as well forget it. By now, they're bludgeoning riffs. We're starting to develop some fiendish quirks. The twist on this one comes from a jam uh, between John Paul Jones and John Bonham. Black Dog was, was my riff. The first one through was hilarious. So I said, Bob's I should just... He said, what is that? I said, a four, I've worked it out. A four will go straight the way through it. Keep the faith <laughs> and it'll work, you know. Black Dog is the most amazing riff. Apparently John Paul Jones uh, came in with the riff itself. There's two interesting things to it. Obviously, it, 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 it's quite unusual, but on the turnaround, the downbeat moves by an eighth beat every time, which, which throws people and can be quite difficult to play. The basic riff... <laughs> ..is the famous part, it's quite straightforward, but when you get to the turnaround, you'll see the downbeat keeps shifting each time, at least I hope you will. <laughs> Which is great for confusing drummers. Black Dog is the opening track on Led Zeppelin 4, itself probably one of the greatest, greatest rock albums of all time. It couldn't have opened in a more astonishingly appealing fashion. I mean, there's that, it's almost like Page is winding his guitar up at the beginning, as just a little sort of couple of seconds of ding, and then bang, they're off. Hey, hey, mama, gonna make you groove, gonna make you sweat, gonna make you move. What else do you wanna know about life? What else do you wanna know about Led Zeppelin? You know, that's it. All in two, two lines, the whole lot, all said and done, perfect. This is such a great song, but this shows you how great Bonham is as well, because he's playing along with a melody, but at the same time, he's playing all those wonderful rhythmic phrases and all the three different sections of the song. Why this works, I think, this track is it's very big, it's threatening, it's a defining moment in rock music. <laughs> Plant and Page slapped their trademark style all over this bludgeoning riff. And Page's solo is actually made up of four different overdubs. He'd, he'd done it with overdub guitar parts before. It's the start of him doing very subtle overdubs and layering guitars on there. There's, there's a lot going on in Black Dog. And if you listen to it, it's, it's, it's one of those tracks you need to listen to on a headphone, on the headphones to pick up some of the subtle overdubs. He's done this for a sonic reason, so that it's almost like, um, like a huge backdrop um, of heavy metal. And that's what, what is sort of, again, it's sort of, it's pinning the listener to the wall, it's sort of, it won't be ignored. It's like you will listen to this track and you'll either love it or hate it, but you will not ignore it. Like Black Dog opens with Page winding his guitar up and letting him fly. Black, uh, rock and Roll opens with a little flourish from, from um, John Bonham. Open hi-hats, washing. See those hi-hats, if you've ever seen, just sort of washing in the wind, that's what we say as drummers. Ringo used to do that, Charlie Watts to some degree, in a different form of course, but the principle was the same, just that wonderful wash of hi-hat going all the way through the song. This great beginning where, with John flailing at the drums, uh, 
is a nick actually from Little Richard's Keep a Knockin. Keep a Knockin, but you can come in. It's the same beginning. But the thing is this, you see, steal from the best. Every art of, artist is a cannibal. And that's a good nick. Rock and roll's great. Rock and roll's one of those, uh, one of those riffs, which often with Jimmy Page stuff, it's all about the feel of the riff. And you can play the right notes, but it's, uh, it never, never clicks in right. It's really just a, a 12 bar progression and you can get that sort of status quo and then you could put other notes in to make it sound a bit more interesting. And if you're being adventurous you could. And what page is it? Just put them all in. Let's get, let's get them all in the same riff. So you get this riff that goes. Which is basically all those, all those things are just played all thrown in the, into the same, the same mix. And then what I love is the way he plays all the overdubs live, because he's, he, uh, he's layered various bits and pieces onto the track. And the key things that he, he punctuates it with are these high, which is actually following the chord progressions. It's, it's, it's leading into the, the chord changes. So when he plays through the progression, which goes from A to D to E, which is a standard, standard 12 bar, he leads into each chord like this. They've listened to a lot of other rock bands by this point and they've kind of made an amalgam of all those bands into something that's very, very commercial without it being a single as such. It's about the most mainstream that Led Zeppelin ever got and um, I think it actually brought in some new fans for them as well. The Led Zeppelin rock and roll song is a brilliant song. It's, it just drives along like a, a lunatic on speed, you know. It's just not that one would endorse that kind of thing, of course, you know. But I mean, it's so powerful, it just pounds, it just drives, it's fantastic. Going to California is a mellow acoustic song that grew naturally out of a jam and then later on seemed to take on a life of its own as Robert's original story about Californian earthquakes seemed to switch to, to become an ode to Joni Mitchell. Joni Mitchell's work is, uh, has been much admired, certainly by Page and Plant. It's an interesting song because you know, I'd already been hooked on Zeppelin with, with albums one and three and then later album number two and then got into Led Zeppelin four and you know for the people who got into Zeppelin early I think it was the power that struck them. Going to California is probably the most mellow song in the Led Zeppelin catalogue. It's also pretty much pure acoustic which is rare for them because usually they would shift into another gear and somewhere along the line the band would just go off into the stratosphere. It's an unusual track and it shows clearly um, Jimmy Page and Robert Plant's um, dedication and liking of folk music, English folk music. Um, in fact, there's no drums or no bass part at all. And it's so it makes this song works as a great foil to the intensity and this sort of overdrive of black dog uh, rock and roll, um, you know, kind of high octane, out and out heavy rockers on the rest of the album. The song seems effortless because by now they knew exactly what they were doing and they knew exactly what effect they were having. Stay away to heaven, what can you say about it? It's a fine track. It's an awesome piece of music. It's obviously one of the most popular tracks. It got bigger than life for Led Zeppelin. Is it Led Zeppelin's finest moment? Yes. Immense amounts of money made out of sales. Is it one of the greatest songs ever written? Yes. Radio play. Is it the greatest song ever written? Yes it is. Etc, etc by any means. It, it, that's the song that separates the tourists from the purists in terms of Led Zeppelin's fans. It's interesting Stairway and um, it's interesting I did mention it as an outstanding track because it's one of those numbers that people either love or hate. Um, when we play it, it's obligatory as a gig and we play it at the gig and the audience sing the song. The, our, our singer hardly has to sing it, which is fantastic. So you have a room full of people all uh, all singing the lyrics word for word. It's a song that people love when they hear it on the radio. If you go to real Zep heads, I think it's one of the last songs they'd pick because familiarity does breed contempt and you hear that song way too much. There's some strange, uh, some strange statistic that if you lined up every time it's been played on American radio, it would just be playing all the time and that's over the past sort of 30 years. As Robert Plant says, it was the right song at the right time. And it's not his fault that in years to come it became more of a cliché. Stairway to Heaven, sometimes people regard it as somewhat of a cliché now because it's such a huge song. It is a mega song, you know, it's in the consciousness of a lot of people that don't even like the song. It's in there. 
burrowing away. It's an amazing piece of music, you know, and when Led Zeppelin used to play it live, this was early days of lighters and things, and to see a whole stadium lit up, now of course it sounds so what, but to see a whole stadium lit up as they played that song, it was, it was wonderful. When we were out touring, and that album hadn't come out, and we played Stay Away in the Forum, and, uh, and we got a standing ovation, I thought, oh, brilliant, you know, because, I mean, I, I knew, well, we all knew it was good, but that was, uh, that was like, you know, for somebody to hear a number, and at that time, that was quite a long number, you know, and, uh, you know, and uh, for the first time, it's always difficult hearing music for the first time, isn't it, you know? That's how I knew it was, was quite something, yeah. Stairway to Heaven marries two very interesting things together and typical of Led Zeppelin. Uh, the dreamy, acoustic, intricate beginning. Um, the sort of soft, tender, lyrical and vocal ideas brought in by, by Robert Plant. And then going into the balls to the wall rock and roll, you know, main section, typical of Led Zeppelin. It's got the acoustic folk side of the band. It's got the mysticism that, that anyone that really loves Led Zeppelin, you know, it's part of the reason that they love Led Zeppelin. It culminates in this massive metallic crescendo and then filters off right at the end back into the sort of the, the soft ether from which it came. The idea of what I had there was to st start it with this, this acoustic piece and then, and then it, for it to build almost like an adrenaline rush by the end and so in fact it actually gets faster from beginning to end it gets it increases in tempo stairway to heaven has wonderful vocals beautiful guitar playing especially the guitar playing beautiful rhythm section everything it's got the lyrics it's got the feel it's got the power it's it's a 10 minute plus epic and live it's it's even better um, but the track was ripped off. The main riff for the song comes from an instrumental by the West Coast band Spirit that Jimmy Page had heard. I would say to the guys, look, you know, you've got so much money, you're having such an incredible time, people love you, is there any need to do this? You know, why don't you just recognise that these people originated these songs? To me, it was sacrilege to Bring an album, bring a track out, bring an album out with a track like Stairway to Heaven and not openly acknowledge where this has come from. But if you can close your mind off to all the distractions about the song and everything that has surrounded the song since, the original magic is still there on the record. You wonder if after the disappointing sales of Led Zeppelin 3 they went back and said, look, we need to go back to, to the template and produce something that the fans really want. It's just got the most amazing riffs on it, some of the most outstanding guitar tracks on it. Uh, I think if you wanted to say what's the, what's the quintessential heavy album, that, that'd be the one if someone had never heard Led Zeppelin at all. I think the reason that Led Zeppelin are so unique as a band is, is because they brought so many musical influences to their songwriting and their playing and the performances. Definitely the best band of the era that at least got into the public eye um, at interpreting other people's songs. Put the four of them together in a studio and they created some of the greatest, if not the greatest, rock music of all time. They had power, they had finesse, they had emotion. I think that they were very ambitious, all as men, and they were determined to forge a new imprint, a new heavy metal sound and I think that's exactly what they did. Led Zeppelin is perhaps the best example of a band who were more than the sum of their parts. That was at the core of an almost mystical aura that surrounded them. They didn't release singles, they didn't appear on television. You had to go and buy their records, then you had to go and see them live. But it created an impact and a strength about the band that makes them unquestionably the best heavy metal band there ever was. And they were never seriously challenged while they were there. If you can't state Led Zeppelin as one of the influences in a rock and roll band, you're not a real rock and roll band. There probably isn't a guitarist who hasn't at one time toyed with a Jimmy Page guitar riff. And certainly there isn't a drummer who hasn't tried to reproduce a John Bonham drum riff. 
powerfully into a Zeppelin band as a band. I mean, anyone who's in rock and roll cannot, whether you love them or hate them, you cannot take away the fact that they are probably one of the most influential rock bands of all time, and I think will remain so. They're also, unfortunately for them, responsible for a million dodgy, second-rate rock and roll bands that tried to be them and just failed miserably. Led Zeppelin were probably the single most important band of the 70s. It's fair to say that heavy metal would not have existed without them.